Here we go. This is uh, AP Dual Credit Psychology Unit 3 Lecture 1, and I think it's that's what it is for L2. I don't have it in front of me. I'm at home, and I forgot some stuff in school. Uh, but this video will be where it's supposed to be. It'll be next to the lecture uh, that it's going over. I'm pretty sure uh, it's around Unit 3 or 4 as well. Uh, for sensation and perception. So uh, we're going to take a look here uh, with sensation and perception. We're taking a look at all information that's coming in through our senses, what I see, what I hear, what I taste, uh, what I touch. Um, so all of my sensations, taste as well, what, what's coming in. And then once it gets in there, how I perceive it. Uh, the fact that some people can see color and other people can't, the fact that dogs can pick up senses that humans can't, um, the fact that some of us are, are uh, alerted to certain things, others of us aren't, uh, the fact that when um, I hear someone speak Spanish, it's blah, 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 uh, but somebody else hears language and a story and everything else, we're getting the same stimulus, but our perception of it is different. So that's what we're gonna take a little bit of a look at here over the next few lectures. Uh, so here's what we're starting with. We're gonna start with the idea of what is sensation. It's a process by which sensory receptors, nervous systems receive and uh, represent the stimulus energy that's happening. We've got two billion bits of information happening every second. Uh, so when I, I'm getting these two billion bits of information, what do I do with it? Um, and what do I pay attention to? And what do I sort of put away? You know, because I'm getting my, my, my uh, feet and my socks right now are feeling pressure. My uh, shoulder where the shirt is, that's feeling some, some stimulation right now. There's other sounds going on in this room that if I stop and focus, I'm aware of, but sometimes I tune out. So my sensation is I'm taking two billion bits of information, but what do I pay attention to? And, and what is that? Uh, that becomes our perception. So if somebody offered you super senses, would you, where you could detect everything going on, odds are you wouldn't want it. You don't really want to smell every smell. You don't want to hear every sound. You don't want to, uh, you, 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 you don't want to see everything. We want to be a little bit selective because if we took it all in, we, we would never, our brains could not process that. So Superman's got some things that he's got to work with. Uh, now, when it comes to perception, again, this is a process of organizing and interpreting this information. So we get it into our brains, but then we have to go, okay, now how does this make sense in the world I know? Again, if somebody is speaking Spanish, that doesn't make sense in the world I know. I mean, I just, I can pick out some words from Dora the Explorer, a Speedy Gonzalez cartoon, but outside of that, uh, I have no experience with it. So we combine our experience with what's going on and what we already know to be true uh, we want to throw that in it, where does it make sense to me you know when i see letters combined right here that make up words these words make sense to me because i've had experience of 52 years on this planet of making sense of these little squiggly lines and everything else that they are in fact letters and then letters make words and these are words i've seen many times so i can perceive language Okay, so now again, we're all taking in the stimulus. A two-year-old or a one-year-old is taking in the, this exact same stimulus, but they don't have the experience of being able to take it and make it into language. So our sensations would be the same, but their perception would be different. It would be different than what mine is. If we take a look at this right here, now again, this idea of the sensation and the perception. The sensation is we have all these various black and white things, but as our eyes naturally sort of go around here and we're trying to take all this information in, it gives us sort of a vibration sort of a look, even though it's not moving at all because our eyes want to gather in all this information. And as we're, our eyes are moving from here to here and it's going kind of across this bump, 
it gives it a sense of waviness. There's no sort of this blurriness we're trying to focus in. So it looks like these are vibrating back and forth, which they're not. You take a look at this. You know, this is a two dimensional object. So how does it fit into my 3D world? You know, I'm getting all the golds and the shadows and the purples and the shadows. But since I've got a shadow here and this is brighter and then this is smaller than that and that's smaller than that, in my mind, I'm perceiving that this is further away because it's very tiny and this must be closer. So it gives me this sense of a dome coming towards me and whether or not that that's what it is, it's flat. So I'm taking all these cues from past experiences, especially experiences living in my three dimensional world. How do I make this two dimensional thing fit into my 3D world? Again, another example right here. This is very, very big. It's a little bit smaller. I assume this is closer and that's further away, which gives me a sense of depth here. Not sure why uh, Buster is in there. That's my cat Buster when we first uh, got him. And then that's him with Stevie uh, when we were first trying. I'm not sure why he's in there. Hmm. Probably need to take that out. Anyway, oh, you know why? Because last, because last um, spring, the last time I taught this, I had just gotten a cat and people wanted a picture of it and I, I put them in there. Uh, so uh, when it comes to processing sensation, there's two ways that we process sensation. There's bottom up, there's top down. Bottom up is the sensation is happening. It's coming up to our brain. All right. So and we all kind of take it in the same. That If I slam the door, we would all look over in that direction. It's a natural, instinctual, loud sound. What is that? It could be danger. We're all going to react to it the same. You know, police sirens, you know, that's a loud sort of a noise. And we're going to pay attention to that particular thing. So again, when we're talking about bottom-up processing, a phone ringing and everybody, you know, assuming that, that that's a noise and it's interrupting something, you know, uh, flashing flickering on a tv so you've got movement and all of us become distracted by that which by the way if someone's talking to you and you're having a conversation and they're suddenly looking over your shoulder at a tv it's not that they don't think you're important could be but it's that we're naturally movement movement naturally attracts us you know and then we work out what it is so bottom up processing we all sort of do the same you know, there's something there, it's coming to us, we're all gonna process it the same. Everybody's gonna see this be the same, it's the same sort of round and whatever. Now, the fact that it is a B and it's a letter, that's a little bit more top-down processing. But bottom up, we're all sort of taking it in, we're taking in the same stimuli, and we have sort of the same, uh, the same reaction to it. It, it. it represents the same thing to all of us. Different from this is what is called top-down processing. Now, top-down, you got to think of, oh, I'm using my brain to determine what this is coming in. So my brain is sort of, based on past experiences and everything else, is going to have an impact on how this stuff gets to me. Uh, we have experience, we have knowledge, we have biases, all these other things that cause us to take the exact same stimuli and look at it a little bit different. We process it different. You know, when some people see uh, people out protesting the Black Lives Matter. Uh, if you're someone who is uh, black and you've experienced racism, that, that's, that speaks to you and, you and it's visceral and you wanna join it. If you're someone who's black and has never really experienced racism, you might be a little bit curious about it going, oh, I don't understand, what's the big deal? Uh, if you're somebody who white who's never experienced racism, uh, it, it, it's cure again, uh, some curiosity there. And if you're someone who's racist, you know, it's just like, well, how dare you protest? America's great and that's all stupid. So everybody's watching the exact same stimulus, but based on their background, they're going to take it in different. As I said before, somebody speaks Italian and I just hear, blah, 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 I just hear syllables, but somebody else hears it and they hear a story or poetry or a, a whatever that the person's trying, directions, whatever they're trying to communicate because it's based on their past experience. So again, top-down processing is taking our past experience and having that impact what we bring in. So our thoughts impact our senses. For example, this word right here, we look at that and we all go, well, that is the word the. Oops. But 
I've got some, a little animation is not there. Uh, so we look at this as the word the, uh, but if I, here, I gotta kinda get rid of that. So if I, if, I, if I take this away from it, it becomes cat. Now this and this are both the same shape, but up here, it looks like an H down there, it looks like an A because of what surrounds it. Kind of a little Oz behind the curtains here for you. Uh, over here, we take a look at this letter. It's A, B, C, but then we go here and that looks like 12, 13, 14. That and that, they're the exact same shapes, but because of what's around them and because of our ability to read letters and numbers now, those look very, very different depending on what surrounds them. Gotta go back and fix that animation. Um, so yeah, we'll just sort of pick up from there. All right. Uh, selective attention versus divided attention. Uh, we can't multitask. Well, uh, we'll talk about this when we get to memory. You can pay attention to about seven to nine items for about 30 seconds. Everything else we do, we're going from one thing to another, to another, to another. We're, 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 we're serial processors, but our ability to process a lot of things at the same time consciously not that good. Two billion bits of information going on. I can only pay attention to a few things. This is why we can't truly multitask. Now, when one task is very simple and doesn't take a lot of concentration, of course we can do both things at the same time. I can talk on the phone while I drive because neither of them takes a tremendous amount of conversation. And what's happening is I'm going from the conversation to driving to the conversation to driving back and forth. Yet if the conversation becomes very, very intense, I may have to pull over. You know, if I'm on the phone and my wife's like, yeah, I had this person going, uh huh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then suddenly she goes, I want a divorce. What? I can't drive right now. I got to pay attention to this. And at the same time, if I'm driving and I'm lost or the weather starts to get bad, Honey, I'll call you back. I, I got to focus on driving. I got to get back on that. So anything that takes a lot of attention, you know, I can text while I walk. Well, you're not thinking about walking. When you walk, you're not going left, pick up the right, put it down, pick up the left. You're not doing that. Uh, and, and this is why a lot of times people go, well, I like to listen to music while I study. Not really good. Uh, because a lot of times that music is distracting because you start paying attention to the lyrics and going back to the words and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. You know, if you've ever been reading and then suddenly you're like, I can't remember the last time I was paying attention, even though words were going into your brain, you weren't processing them because you were thinking of something else. All right. You can't focus on every conversation at a party. Yet, if you're talking to somebody at a party, then somebody someone near you mentions your name, not even talking to you, just mentions your name, you're gonna pay attention to that. And that's what's known as a cocktail party phenomenon. Our ability to sort of filter out every other conversation and focus on this person, but at the same time being attracted to ourselves and things about us, that if somebody from across the way were talking about me, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and now that's gonna go over to that. So we really don't have the ability to divide our attention. And this is one of the big reasons for teen accidents because you don't have a lot of experience driving. I mean, as you become older and you have more experience and those neural connections are better and better and better and better, distractions in the car aren't as bad. But when you're 16, 17, and you've only been driving for a year or so, and then you suddenly add in the car radio and your cell phone and your friends in the car and all these other things. And I don't care if you've got a hands-free device. It's because, because doing this and doing this, there's really not much of a difference there. I mean, the difference is paying attention to what's in here. You know, the, the, most teen accidents, there's other people in the car because they were distracted by that. Or you were on the phone, even with the hands free, because you're paying attention to the conversation. Uh, or you're jamming along with the radio and you're thinking about the lyrics, whatever. And suddenly these new things you can't process because your brain's busy. Then you also throw in the fact that you have this feeling of inferiority, uh, that your life's going to last forever. Uh, and it becomes tricky. It becomes really, really tricky. I want you to take a look at this right here, a little YouTube video. I want to see if this is actually going to work out. Uh -huh. Enter backspace. There we go. So this is something that we took a look at in class. I'm not sure where it's taking me here. Here we go.
little awareness test. This is an awareness test. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? How many passes does the team in white make? Here we go. There's one, there's two, there's three. Keep going. Okay. And you come up with your answer, whatever your particular answer may be. All right. Here's your answer. The answer is 13. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalk in there? What? Rewind. Now look over here. Pay attention right here. And here he comes. There he is. And there he goes. Now, if you think that was switched out, let's go back to the beginning of the video here. So this is back at the beginning. And here he is, right in the middle. Now, the reason that you weren't able to notice him, or if you were able to notice him, you weren't able to count the number of shots because he was going on. I could either pay attention to this guy where I'm going six, seven, and what the hell's that? You know, why is he there? And then suddenly I lost track of the shots. Or I'm so busy paying attention to the shots, I'm not paying attention to him, especially because how many does a team in white? So my brain is going, if, you, if you're wearing black, I can't pay attention to you. No attention to black, no attention to black, no attention to black. So you basically zoned out black, only looking at white shirts and the ball. That's it. So this goes by you as a result of that. As a result, you do not see that because you can't see that. Because, this is an awareness oh wow, test. now it's working in the frame. Uh, so, so, we cannot multitask because once by, by focusing on these guys throwing the ball, I can't pay, I'm zoning these guys out intentionally. So anything else in black, not going to pay attention to. And again, even if you did see the bear, even if you did see the bear, then you lost how many passes were thrown. Our ability to multitask, not good. It's really not good at all. Uh, so here's some other things there on texting. Again, more of the do you know that you, if you want to go back and look at uh, sort of distractions and things such as that, some good information there. Feel free to pause uh, to take a look at that on your own. And again, what we were just talking about is what is called inattentional blindness. And inattentional blindness means that our ability to focus is very, very limited to consciously focus. Now, subconsciously, we take a bunch of things in. But our ability to consciously focus, we've got to get rid of some things. Again, the pressure of my sock on my foot right now, my sock is rubbing up against my foot. But most of the time, I don't pay attention to it. My senses just adapt to it because I don't have time to pay attention to it. I go outside and I look and the sky is blue. Yeah, because it's supposed to be blue. Every time I look up, it's blue. So I don't process it anymore. I assume it's still blue. And this is inattentional blindness because I'm not encoding it. And when we don't encode it, it's like it never happened. Okay. You know, if I asked you if you drove to school today, what was the color of the car behind you as you drove to school today? Or the last time you drove, you know, name the models of six different cars that were behind you. First off, you probably never processed it. And when you did see it, it never went to your long-term memory because it's not important what color that car was. Uh, if you talked to your friend earlier in the day and I asked you what color were their shoes, you know, you, it was in your vision, but the, it doesn't make any sense to process it. So it just goes away. You never paid attention to it. And this is one of the difficulties with eyewitness testimony is because details experienced, a lot of them were never noticed. They were never noticed. If I watch, if I, if I was a witness to a guy murdering somebody else and then they, and then I'm there and I'm testifying, yeah, he killed him. And what color was his shirt? I don't know. Well, you don't even know what color his shirt was. Or if I say the wrong color, then that suddenly discredits me as a witness. I never encoded it. It was never part of it. So it wasn't important to me. Here's an example of inattentional blindness in action. Here's what we've got. We've got some crosses going around. I've got a solid dot there. I've got a solid dot here. And I've got a solid dot here. And in the middle, I have a blinking dot. Okay, now I'm going to put this arrow over here. What I want you to just focus on is the green blinking dot. Put all your attention on the green blinking dot. Okay, and as you do, notice in your peripheral vision, 
the other dots start to disappear until you go back and look at them and then they're there. But again, since I'm so focused on green dot, green dot, green dot, the other ones disappear because they're not important. And then what's happening is this black's being dragged over there and I just assume to fill it in. My peripheral vision, everything outside of my focus is very, very weak. My focus is only about the size of a nickel, quarter, about my thumbnail. You push your thumbnail way out there and that's good focus. Everything outside of that thumbnail is based on what I think it is, what I assume it is, what it was five seconds ago. And I sort of piece all those together, which is why a lot of times these things in our peripheral, we don't notice. We don't notice because we don't pay attention to it. We assume it's the same that it was when we processed it two seconds ago. So again, focusing on the green dot, green dot, green dot, other dots disappear. What also is difficult for us to process is change. We don't notice a change because we're not expecting a change. You know, so I process something and then it changed to something else and I wouldn't notice it because I'm not expecting it to change. I'm expecting it to same, stay the same. It's why a lot of times you don't notice somebody's haircut. You know, mistaking one waiter for another one. We were not going to notice these things because a waiter is a waiter, a haircut. You're not going to notice. You know, if my wife comes home and says, you know, it's anything different about me today. <sighs> no, uh, because I don't take inventory every day. She could have gone shopping. She could be wearing a new blouse. It's just a blouse. I don't, I'm not telling you when's the last time she wore that one. I see I, I'm not expecting it. So when you're not expecting change, it's hard for us to calculate that change. You take a look at this study over here where this guy is talking to this guy, this guy in a blue jacket is asking this gentleman directions and then they have a little distraction where construction workers bring a big slide and oh, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. And then they switch this guy with this guy and this guy most of the time, about 50 to 60% of the time will not notice that it's a different guy. The reason they don't notice it's a different guy because they're not expecting it. It's still a white guy in a jacket. You know, you, you, weren't, you weren't calculating, okay, what is every little thing he's wearing and all these other things. We're not encoding that. We're not paying attention to it. So, so when it changes, we don't notice it. We don't notice. And again, we'll talk about this down the road with memory, but that's where memory becomes very, very faulty because there's very little that we're truly encoding. And then where we get sort of distracted is other people's stories and videos we see and whatnot. And this is the expertise of an illusionist because the entire job of an illusionist, because magic doesn't exist, but, the, but it's, to, it's to distract you over here while they do something over here. I'm sorry, distract you over here while they're doing something over here because I can only pay attention to that one particular thing at a time. For example, pay attention to this picture at the right. Here it is. Focus on it, bird, worm, sort of thing going on there. Take it away, bring back another version of the same picture. There's some differences there. Can you notice all of them? Most of it's pretty difficult. A lot of people will notice the little smile on the snake is different because that's kind of, this is where their focus was. So they'll notice that, but the flower doesn't have a dot. Cloud missing, smile snake, a lot of people notice that. And then an extra leaf over here. Well, again, I'm not processing all that stuff. So when you make a little change like that, I'm not gonna notice. But if I'm a lawyer and you're a witness and I wanna discredit you, how could you not notice there's an entirely different leaf and their job is to discredit you. That's their job, okay? Take a look at this mask right here. Notice that this is the front of the mask, but when we see it at the beginning, it looks like the mask is coming towards me. It's going away from me because my brain wants to process it like it doesn't make sense for a face to be concave. It makes sense for it to come out towards me. And since it doesn't make sense, it's, I'm going to process it the way that it makes sense and the way that it fits into my world. Here's another one with Charlie Chaplin going a little bit faster there, but it's the same thing. Both sides of it seem like they're coming towards you because that's what you assume they would be doing. Why would they be concave? Does it make sense? So when all of this information is coming into our senses and it's going to our brain, that is the process of what is called transduction because we're getting all this energy from the world. And we'll talk about it coming from the eyes and the ears and the nose and all that. And then what happens is we all get these same electrical signals 
or I'm sorry, the, the same the vibration, the same energy coming to us. And then we have to transfer it into electrical signals for our brain to read as through neurons. So the sensation comes in, we transduce it into energy, and then based on past experiences, we perceive it as something. So it's a kind of a two-step process. There's the sensation, then once we, we, once we sense it, then we have to perceive, now what is it? And all this travels through the thalamus, with the exception of smell. For some reason, smell doesn't go through the thalamus. I guess it just goes right to where it's supposed to. Uh, but smell is also very important with memory too. Uh, it's one of the bigger, bigger triggers of memory more than anything else is smell. So when we're studying psychophysics, psychophysics is the study of the relationship between the physical characteristics of the stimuli and our psychological experience of what this stimuli is. A lot of stimuli we're blind to. We don't see microwaves, x-rays, radio waves, ultraviolet rays, uh, high-pitched sounds we can't hear, whatever. Yet these are the same things that a lot of other animals are very sensitive to. You know, bats don't have great vision, but they have the big ears and great hearing, so they can pick up those sounds. A dog can smell things that we can't smell. Uh, so all stimuli has to be measured, whether it's the level of brightness, the level of volume, the weight, the sweetness, whatever. There's different sorts of levels of picking this up, and this is the study of psychophysics. Now, when it comes to humans, we have what is referred to as an absolute threshold. An absolute threshold is the least amount of stimulus it would take to go from nothing to something. Now, one of the problems with measuring this is we've got to assume that nothing's going on you know, vision, it's absolute darkness and sensory deprivation. There's no sound or no, there's no sight whatsoever. Hearing, <clears throat> there's gotta be absolutely no sound. <clears throat> Even as I'm talking to you right now here in, in my home, in my office, I can hear somebody outside mowing the lawn. It's nobody at my house because I'm the one who has to mow the lawn, uh, but somebody uh, to, to, is, is mowing the lawn. <clears throat> you can't pick that up, I can pick that up. Um, the sound of my laptop over here whirling and things like that. So it's hard to go get the absolute thing because it means we gotta have nothing. But <clears throat> assuming that we could get rid of all sensation, the absolute threshold is the least amount of stimulus it would take to detect some stimuli. All right, so vision. These are all proved scientifically. I could see a candle flame 30 miles away on a clear night which meant if it was absolutely dark outside, pitch black, and there's no curvature of the earth, if somebody's lighting a candle in Hempstead, I should be able to, I should be able to see that. Well, the problem is, is we gotta assume all, there's, there's no traffic on 290, all the street lamps are out, there's no stars in the sky, there's just nothing. So, that's it's kind of hard to prove that but an absolute threshold is nothing to something hearing i could hear a watch ticking from 20 feet away if there's no other sound you know uh tasting it should be able to pick up one teaspoon of sugar dissolved in two gallons of water smell one drop of perfume in a three-room house touch a bee's wing distance one centimeter is a cheek now again some people are more sensitive some people have better vision than others some people have better hearing than others some people are more sensitive to, to touch it depends on which part of touch we're talking about you know your upper arm or your belly isn't nearly as sensitive as your fingers the very tip of your finger is probably the most sensitive part of your body which is why braille is read with that so it, it, it's tricky with an absolute threshold, but again, it's going from nothing to something with the least amount of stimuli if there's nothing else distracting. And again, when there's no other distraction, the stimuli seems even louder. You know, you open up a piece of candy or a bag of potato chips or chew some potato chips, nobody really hears it. But if it's suddenly quiet in the room and everyone's taking a test, it's like, oh, crow. it sounds like the loudest thing ever because there's no other stimulus that's going against it. All right, now, signal detection theory is based on my experience and based on my perception, my ability to pick up a signal, all right? And it, it's based on experience. If you're someone who sings, you know if something's in tune or out of tune, or you play an instrument. If, it, if it's proper pitch and singing flatness, I don't know what any of that means because I don't have the experience as a singer, but you do. Somebody who is an experience uh, doing like uh, working for a radar detector, you know, and, and doing, uh, 
doing air traffic control here. He's going to notice the difference between a blip that's a 747 and a blip that's a flock of birds. He knows it by the pattern and the elevation and everything else because his ability to detect those signals are very good. Uh, somebody who's an experienced parent uh, can tell when a baby's crying just to get attention versus the baby's crying because it's in pain or hungry or needs change, whatever. Uh, somebody drinking wine, you know, someone can you know, smell it, taste it and go, oh, it's from the Tuscany region, it's from 72, you know. I drink wine, it's sour grape juice. Yet as a teacher, I can pick up on certain things that other people can't pick up, you know, when kids are cheating at their desk, uh, when somebody wrote an essay, but it's not really their words, you know, because again, I've gotten that stimulus again and again and again throughout experience, you're, you're able to pick these things up. So again, experience, expectations, your level of fatigue, you know, if you're tired, these blips aren't gonna make as much sense to you as if you're alert. Uh, so all of these are part of signal detection theory. Here's an example right here. You take a look at that picture, most of us have no idea what it is. If you look harder and you look harder and you look harder, what's going on is it is a cow. Top of the head, ears, ear, eye, eye, nose. Now once you get that, that's his head and those are his ears and that's his face down to his nose, face coming up, ear, eyeball, eyeball. Once you see it, once I take it away, you can't help but see it. He's always there because now you have the experience of taking these shadows and shapes and, and turning them into a cloud. Uh, and again, you know, art. My wife looks at art and she goes, oh, look at the paintbrush and the stroke and the duh. I'll be at the, I'll be at the art museum with her downtown in the, in the Montrose area. And I'm just like, a six-year-old could do that. What the hell? You know, but, but I don't have the appreciation. I can't pick up those signals as well as she can. Um, we take a look at this right here. Well, the humans have an unbelievable ability to focus in on our faces. Faces we're really good on. So even though that this is a mountainscape, we see an eye, a nose, and a mouth, and that becomes a face to us. This is a real picture of a tiger, but what we get drawn to, especially because this is our focal point, eye, nose, mouth, chin. His stripes happen to make a little sort of a ghost face right there, and we see it. We see it because as humans, we naturally, ever since we're little babies, little babies are attracted to, to faces. And throughout our lives, we're there to recognize them. And the face that people seem to recognize more than everybody else, uh, especially in, in, uh, when you look at people who are Christian, is the face of Jesus. And they want to see Jesus. I want to detect Jesus because I want to, I want to be true that my beliefs are there and everything else. So this is a photograph back from the 1800s of a family, but a lot of people go, there he is, Jesus, his head just floating up in the air. It's not, because again, this is a three-dimensional scene, but it's a two-dimensional picture. So what we have to do is we gotta go, what's the foreground and what goes into the background? How do I make this stuff work? You know, you take a look at, say, my two hands right there in the picture, all right? They're both the same distance from the camera. Now, this one's further away. Well, now he's smaller, these closer. So we got to use these sorts of cues to go, how do I take this little two-dimensional image, which is this camera, and fit it into your 3D world? Same thing here. But what people are screwing up is they're not, they're not showing the difference. This is a man. This is his wife. This is a baby sitting on his lap. This baby, that's his white shirt, his little face in there, and he's got this big old white hat on covering the top of his head. This is the background. So that you've got to push back. And then this you got to bring forward in order to see it. But a lot of people like to take this and make it the same plane, but it's not. And to show you again, again, the baby's hat, half of his face underneath the hat and his shirt right there. It's a baby sitting on the guy's lap. But we got to take all this stimuli and we got to, we got to perceive it in a way that makes sense to us. And again, love seeing Jesus. Can't get enough of Jesus in my iron. Jesus on a potato chip. Uh, crucifixion in an orange. Uh, you know, there's Jesus on a, what is it, an English muffin. He's in a mountain. He's on a banana. He's being crucified on the poles. He's in my coffee cup. Clouds, whatever. We want to see it because, because for people who have that particular faith, you know, you want a sign. You want a sign that everything you've sort of believed in is true. So are we truly seeing it? 
<clears throat> or are we perceiving what we want to perceive? Now, when it comes to subliminal messages, a subliminal message is something we pick up less than 50% of the time. All right, now, so when you say subliminal message, it makes a lot of people scary because they're afraid if they hear subliminal message, someone's gonna sneak a message to me and make me cluck like a chicken or something. That's the fear, it, and it really shouldn't be. It's just the idea of, it's, it's since you're not consciously picking it up, but subconsciously you could be picking it up, and since subconsciously you could be picking it up, that's going to get you to act in a certain way is the idea behind it. Now, where subliminal messages really came out uh, as a big deal was back in the 70s uh, because uh, movie theaters back in the 50s and 60s were like, we're not selling enough popcorn, we're not selling enough soda. So here's what we need to do. We need to flash the words hungry, eat popcorn at every three for a three thousandth of a second. Put it up there and then people are going to get hungry or they're going to get thirsty and they'll come and get it, right? And that'll work. It doesn't work. It does not work. It's a little music playing in the, in the mall and they shop at Kohl's. It doesn't work. It does not work. If you want people to eat popcorn in your movie, you got to have somebody chomping on popcorn. And people look at that and they start salivating. They start having that classical conditioning going on. And then they want the popcorn. So it's why when you walk into a movie theater, the first thing you smell popcorn, that puts it in your head. That's a conscious thing. It's a conscious thing sort of going on, or we see others in line for it, oh, they're in line for it, it must be important. That's what works, okay? But again, subliminal messages, you detect it less than 50% of the time, but people are so fearful of it for things like this. All right, this is, uh, this is an advertisement for gin back in 1973. All right, and they go, break out the frosty bottle of gin. So you got a big tall glass of gin here and pour ice cubes in there. And the problem is, is there's a subliminal message. And the subliminal message is this. Yeah, I want to see it. Here it comes. There's the letter S, there's an E, and there is an X, S-E-X. And the idea is if you pick this up subconsciously, it'll get your hypothalamus going because your hypothalamus wants sex. All right. And then it'll go, ooh, I want gin. And it'll associate the, the feeling of wanting sex with the gin and more people will buy gin. They don't work. They don't work. But it doesn't stop advertisers from trying to do it. A study that showed it didn't work was a Canadian television station back in 1982. I think it was uh, said, we're going to put on a subliminal message during a popular 30 minute show. They said, we're going to flash a subliminal message 352 times, 352 times. And 500 people wrote in and they responded, but nobody could guess what the message was. Half the people said, I was strangely hungry. I was really thirsty. Well, is that really what, you, is it because of the thing or you just sort of, there's a subliminal message, I need to act like I'm being subliminated or whatever. The message was telephone now and nobody called. No one called. All right. We are more influenced by what we think we are supposed to hear. You know, if you think of the tape study we talked about back when we did research, but a lot of people still think it's a powerful advertising tool. You take a look at here, meet the snackers. This is a dollar bill. This is a KFC snacker, which costs a dollar. So they take this right here, half of Washington's face in this part of the dollar, and they put it right there. You got to want to just put a big $1 up there. But so you tried to sneak it into the lettuce. Joe Camel, we talk about that in class. Male genitalia right up top there, axe body spray, and you take a look and you got the S, the E, and the X, get your hypothalamus going because the ladies can't resist you. Without that, Skittles, another subliminal message there. Uh, Disney, we talk about this in class. This Disney, any cartoon, there's no subliminal messages in cartoons. It's just a bunch of artists going, hey, let's see what we can put on there. So when the DVD comes out, we can kick back and laugh about it. All right, that's what it is. There's no subliminal messages there. I know you can, are you positive to SCX or it's SFX, which is a special effects company. You see what you want to see, but it, it, again, subliminal messages time and time again, it's proven they really don't work. Now, when it comes to a differential threshold, a differential threshold is noticing a difference in stimulus. If I take this light right here and turn it out, do you notice a difference? You probably do because it darkens half my face, turn it on, and you notice the difference in stimulus. We don't go absolute pitch black to a little bit more light, but how much stimulus would it take? There, I turned out that light, 
and to this side, to this side, my lamp over here, you don't really notice, but there is a difference in light. And the reason you don't is because that's competing against the energy from the window that's, that's coming in to me. All right, so the differential threshold is how much more stimuli would you need to notice a difference? If you're carrying a bunch of groceries, two grocery bags, and I, I drop in a cookie you're not, or a Snickers bar, you're not gonna notice it. Uh, but if you had nothing in your hands and I put a Snickers bar there, you're going to notice it. All right. So it depends on how much more stimulus would it take to notice there's more stimulus. And mostly it's, it would take 2% more weight for me to notice there's more weight, 8% more light, 0.3% more in the tone, et cetera. So it's the difference in the stimulus. Uh, sensory adaption. What happens is when a stimulus is happening so much, we, we adapt to it. We get used to it. You know, uh, when we're in a dark theater, our pupils become bigger so we can get that energy in. And that's why if you leave a dark theater and you walk outside, it, it hurts because your pupils are so big. Uh, your clothes on your body, you don't pay attention to those. They're just there, a cold swimming pool. You jump in, the water doesn't get any warmer. But what happens is the signals of the cold stop going to your brain. Odors that you don't agree with uh, street noise. If you live in a big city, you're used to crowds and you're used to street noise. You live in a, a small suburban area or the rural area and you suddenly you're visiting New York City, it can be overwhelming to a lot of us. And that's why our eyes are constantly moving around so as we don't adapt to it. Uh, this right here is a little example of sensory adaption. You take a look at this little dot right here and you focus and you focus and you focus. What happens is around here, your eyes are starting to adapt to this sort of movement. As you just focus on the white dot, focus on the white dot, focus on the white dot, your eyes are getting used to that motion. So if I were to ask you to suddenly take your attention away from that dot and look at your hand, your, the skin on your hand would seem to move. You look back on it, adapt, adapt, adapt. You look back to your hand, woo, seems to move around a little bit. And that's because your eyes are getting used to moving around, moving around, moving around. So it looks like the skin on your hand is crawling. Uh, it's like being on a boat all day. And then you get off a boat and you feel like you're bouncing up and down or being on a trampoline and you get off the trampoline and your legs feel like they're closer to the ground, whatever. Our senses adapt to it. Give you another example. Keep staring and staring and staring. Stare at the dot. Your eyes go around, go around, go around. Now, if I give you another still picture, this still picture will look to move like that one there. A little bit of motion. Okay. We take a look at this. Everything, this one's a little bit different because it's all going in the same direction. It's not going opposite directions. So this is all going to the right, going to the right, going to the right. Very quickly here, a little bit slower out there. But if you focus and focus and focus, and then I switch it to a picture, the picture is going to move the opposite direction because your eyes are so used to going this, you're trying to counter this way, and then you overcompensate when you get the new picture. Stroop effect is when you have these two competing stimuli going against one another. It takes longer for us to process that. If I ask you to read the following words, red, blue, orange, purple, orange, blue, green, red, blue, purple, green, red, orange, blue, red, Green, purple, orange, red, blue, green, red, blue, purple, orange, blue, red, green, purple, orange, red, blue. Pretty easy because I'm used to taking this stuff in, the stimuli of the shapes and whatnot. I know, I, know what, I know how to read. But if I simply ask you, don't tell me what the word says, tell me what color the word is, it becomes a little bit difficult. Beginning, pretty easy because they match up. Red, blue, orange, purple. Remember the color of the word. Orange, blue, green, red, green. Red, purple, blue, blue, red, green, orange, red. It takes an extra half second. And that's a Stroop effect. It takes an extra little bit because we want to say orange, I mean green, red, green, orange, orange, blue, purple. We want to, we want to, we, we want the stimuli of the words. Now, if I asked a two-year-old to do this, tell me what color each of the words are, they're going to have a much easier time because they can't read. So the shape of the letters is not going to be a distractor. And this is also why it's very difficult for most of us to lie. The reason it's difficult for most of us to lie is because there's the truth in our brain. And then we got to go, we got to put the truth away and then come out with a lie. Uh, so where were you last night? I was at the uh, mall and I was, uh, I went to, uh, 
the Nike store, you know, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that's sometimes a tell of a lie because you're taking the truth and repressing it so you can come out with something else. So other stuff right there. That gets us through a very, very long lecture. Any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me about that. And uh, next we'll talk about, uh, I think, the eye, if I'm not mistaken.